here. But Elder Devin said something to me when I was here because on Tuesday night, uh, you know, that, that's my special service. And sometimes I, I get thoughts on Tuesday that I don't get any other time. I don't know why that is. But I, I'm going to bring sun, uh, Tuesday on Sunday. Some of you don't get there on Tuesday. So let, let me bring Tuesday into Sunday and and share some of the things that I shared on Tuesday and in, embellish it. But Elder Devin said, when I spoke on something, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go back to Mega Church and preach this. He says, can you preach it at San Fran? Because I, I love to hear more of that. And uh, I see he's not here today, but he, he can get the CD. And I do want to share something that I feel is important to every one of us. Stand with your Bibles in your hand. <clears throat> We're going to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'll give you two or three extra minutes to find it. Uh, I'm sure it's not a book that you read often. I want to thank you for how you responded to the hurricane victims on uh, that project a couple Saturdays ago, uh, Demetrius Johnson called me. He was all excited. He said, man, you got some church, some people. And uh, he just went on and on and on and on. So I want to thank you for blessing the community and uh, all that you did for that occasion. Ann Barfield, Mary Kester, and all, all of you. I, I don't want to call names because uh, I shouldn't have started that. But just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that uh, the project you're doing at the other church, we're doing a project for Puerto Rico because, as you know, we have quite a few Spanish uh, in that church, and some are affected by what's the hurricane that's going, that went on in Puerto Rico, and uh, so we want to bless them. One of the members came by, like a daughter to us. She cleaned up my closet, and she, she made me throw away about 30 pair of shoes that I had for 20 years. And they're just a little small, but I thought that one day I might be able to, you know. She said, throw those things away. So somebody's going to be blessed with some gators and lizards and all kind of things. Amen. Uh, I would envy them. But we thank you for all that you're doing here. I love y'all. Will you, will you give somebody a hug for me? Amen. Just give somebody. Give me something. Tell them I love you. Amen. I love you, Uncle Charles. I love you. First Samuel chapter 13, verses 6 through 14. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and in cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. Let me pause there. Marjorie, we, you said you can't wait to hear what God's done for me in this month of September. I've had so many checks until I don't know what to do with the money. That's the truth. It, it took me back uh, years ago when in October I had so much money, I told God, don't give me any more. It almost... <laughs> I'm, I didn't ask for volunteers. <laughs> this is the God truth. It 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 came cl very close to being that way this week, and we still got another week. This is September. It's, it's the month of blessing and prosperity. Nothing negative. Don't think about anything negative. <laughs> This is the month of, and if you haven't been blessed yet, 
You got six more days. Just tell somebody, you got six more days. I don't know why you interrupted my reading of the scripture. Amen. I thought about that. God is good. Verse 8 says, He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. <clears throat> you acted foolishly, Samuel said. You should not have kept the command the Lord your God gave. You should have not. You have not, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Bless thy word unto our hearts. Glorify thy name. In the nombre de Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. You might be seated. I want to share to this morning briefly on surviving under the weight of time. Say it with me. Surviving under the weight of time. Say it again. Surviving under the weight of time. This is a pressurized society. I, I, I'm sure you have the same testimony that I've never seen times like we are in now. I've never seen the, I've never seen the, the government in such array as they are now. I've never seen such carrying on and foolishness in the White House as we have going on now. I've never seen a president attack just everything he can and everybody he can. <clears throat> now he's attacking Steph Curry and LeBron James. I mean, <laughs> LeBron James said, you bum. I I've never heard anyone just out just, just disrespecting and putting the president down like that. And so as soon as he said you bum, now you can get you bum t-shirts right, right, right now to wear, wear them. It, 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 it's, it's just a critical, critical, critical time that we're in. And, and uh, yes, we, we do talk about what's going on in the White House, but one thing we need to do is talk to God about the White House. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> hallelujah. We need to talk to God about all this stuff that's going on, you see. It, it, because if my people, yeah, I, I, God said I'll do something about it if my people. And could it be that God is not moving as quickly as he would because his people? He says pray so that you and I might have a peaceful time. So that our lives might be better, you got to pray for the head. So we're in a pressurized society. We're in a society that there are timelines. We have time schedules. We, we, we leave home uh, with measured miles in our thinking. We calculate how much time it takes me to get from here to there. You calculated this morning how much time you should you need to get dressed and leave the house. I, I'm amazed that there are certain people who are late all the time and haven't figured out why. You know, if you're always late 20 minutes, it just seems like your general math would tell you to leave 20 minutes. Ask somebody, like, why haven't you figured that out? Come on. But we calculate our weeks down to a science. 
And many times when we plan, we don't plan for interruptions. We don't plan for glitches. We don't plan for delays. We jump on Highway 270 and we expect it to be clear. What's going on today? It's backed up. Looks like a parking lot. Don't y'all know I'm coming? I'm late. I need to get there. You see, we are so time conscious, but and everything is calculated until we don't plan for those kind of interruptions and delays. Any events that happen that were unforeseen throws us into a dither. Because we have the attitude, this shouldn't have happened to me. I plan to leave here a certain time and everything should be clear. But that's not the way life goes. And sometimes we plan so thoroughly until we don't have time for time. You'll get that later. Plan time can become our own enemy. Even when we are all going to the same places, the calculation of time varies. It varies in my house. People ask me, how have you stayed married for 48 years? Two cars is the secret. One for me to leave early and one for my wife to leave late. That kept our marriage together. Amen. When we're going places, we all have different ways of calculating how much time it takes for us to get there. Each of us places a different value on time. Let me move. We even have time so ingrained in our minds until we dare put God on a time clock. We even give God a time that he needs to work for doing this in our lives and that in our lives. We, 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 we are bold enough to take what's in eternity and try to make it fit into time. We take eternity and we try to reduce it into time. We, we block off a certain amount of time for God to show up. And if he doesn't appear within our time frame, he's considered, God's considered a no-show. <laughs> and when we consider God a no-show, then we begin to process, we begin the process of making things happen or activating the plan that we created. Because we're suspect that God may not come through. Let me say this about all of us. How many of us secretly underneath believe that God is not going to come through for us? We won't say it, but in the back of our minds, we've got plan B. C, D, and E. And we make these plans in our mind that if God doesn't come through, then I don't have time really to wait to see if he's going to. So I need to go on with plan, plan B. When God says something, we have a way of doing one of two things, and normally the, choose, the one that we choose is not really the correct one to choose. And that is, we 
evaluate the word of God rather than hear the word of God. You see, if we would spend more time hearing and believing and less time evaluating and succession planning, we would have less tests to endure. Faith does not come by evaluating. Faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing means that it goes into the depth of me, into my spirit. And when I hear, really hear God speak to my spirit and I latch on to that, then that faith or that hearing God produces faith in me that I can latch on to what God said and not let go no matter what it takes or how long it takes for God to do it because I have heard him. And as a result of hearing him, I believe what he says at any cost. Our baskets of blessing would be a little fuller if only we had listened. We had fainted unless we had believed. You and I have got to just believe what God says. As simple as this sounds, it's a problem for us to just hear God and believe. He says, let the sick say, we don't do that. Because we don't believe. We haven't found a way to be sick and believe that we're well yet. We haven't found a way to be broke and believe that we are rich. We haven't found a way to see one thing and yet believe another. And and what you and I see is so much more real to us than what we hear. Because what we hear is invisible. You, 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 You can't, you, you can't, you can't. It's hearing, it's, it's hearing. But what we see is so real. And many times what Not many times, all the time. What God puts in our hearing is different than what we see. And seeing becomes so real to us. But God does not speak by seeing. He speaks by saying. And when he says it, it is true. It may not even exist. But God doesn't need anything to exist in order for it to be true. Y'all not hearing me. It is true whether you can feel it, touch it, see it, sense it. It is true. Darkness was over the face of the deep. What God saw was darkness, but what he said was light. You don't look at darkness and say, let there be light. Darkness does not have the capability of producing light. But God was not limited to what he saw. And what he saw was not restricted to what he said. Because when he said it, it moved all the restrictions by what existed. 
And God said, let there be. He doesn't have to see it to say it. You don't hear me. I said he doesn't have to see it to say it. And you shouldn't have to see it to say it. And you shouldn't have to see it to believe it after he says it. Stop evaluating what God says. Evaluation means we take what God says and run it to our, through our minds. And we come out with an answer. And let me tell you, the answer you will always come out with when you take what God says and run it through your mind. You will always come out with it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I told you about the member in my church. When I said, hey, whatever you give, add three zeros to it. God's going to give you that. So she gave 300. The other zeros would not make sense. And she was the only one that did it, so it didn't make sense to the church. But, but God speaks to a congregation to sift out faith. <laughs> He'll say something to everybody to just to get one to rise up and believe. Everybody else will keep doing what they're doing, but that one will rise up. And believe. And I said, give $300 and God's going to add three zeros to it. That only made sense in the spirit to one person. Everybody else was looking at their circumstance, their wallets, their worth, their bank account. Mm. Bills the next day. Who I owe. Who I, who I got, you see, and when you get in that realm, you cannot be in the realm of faith when you're trying to figure out facts. Y'all don't hear me. You don't hear me. You can't walk in faith and facts too. The fact is, I'm sick, but Jesus says I'm healed. So I got to walk in either the fact or the faith. And so I said to the church, give $300 today and God's going to add three zeros. One person gave that 300. When I got back home, said that God did exactly what you said. That meant she got 300. I said, you got three zeros in addition to the two zeros? She said, I said, God did exactly what he said he would do. One person was blessed because they believed what they didn't see, but what they heard. I said years ago, I said, I want everybody to give tithes on what you want to make. Give tithes on what you want your check to be. And once again, it was said in the congregation so that God could raise the level of faith in one person and bless the one person to believe. And one person did that. They wrote a check on not what they made, but on what they wanted to make. And within two weeks time, they came to me and said, I got a raise. And it was the exact amount of what I tithe on a couple weeks ago that I wasn't making. But when I wrote my check, 
I brought it into existence. Y'all don't hear me? Why don't you hear me? I can't even preach. You don't write the check on what you can afford. You write the check based on what you hear. I'm going to get to the message. Y'all messed my message up. Who did that? I don't even know where I am. I don't even know where I am. This doesn't even look right now. God is in need of people who were here. He said, be hearers of the word. Hearers of the word. You've got to hear. Why is it that we come Sunday after Sunday and Sunday and have Sunday and Tuesday and some come on Wednesday, some come on Friday, and, and we still don't hear? Why are we wasting our time sitting here taking notes and we don't believe what we're writing? Okay, thank you, Father. He said, Samuel had told Saul, he said, now Saul, I'm coming. Now Samuel is a, a prophet and Saul's a king. They both have their own assignments. They all have their own, they each have their own lane. I'm going to tell somebody, stay in your lane. Because if you cross the lane, you'll get wrecked. You'll crash. And so the prophet Samuel said, now, Saul, I want you to stay in your lane. And I'm going to come and I'm going to offer a sacrifice. Now, this was prophetic. It had not happened. And it happened really in the 10th chapter, and I'm not going to go back there. And so really the time period is more than seven days. It was, more, it was a few years. But now here Samuel is rehearsing again. He said, now it's seven days before I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up, Saul, in seven days. I'm going to show up in seven days. Now when God says he's going to do something, in a time period. He means he's going to do something. In that time period. Now while God is doing something in that time period. So is Satan. What is Satan doing? Satan is trying to counter. Everything that God says. He is going to do for what purpose so you won't believe for what purpose so that you will pull out your plan and said I've got a plan and if God's plan doesn't work mine will but when will we learn that our plans never work The only thing you and I can plan is plan to fail. Because it's going to happen. Let God, come on, help me somebody. Let God, come on. Let God be what? And every man sitting next to you a liar. God says through Samuel, I'm going to come and offer a sacrifice. And you can read the story and get the whole gist. He says, I'm coming in seven days. Seven days. What's seven days? The perfect number. The complete number. Seven. Seven candlesticks. Stretch on the boy. Seven sneezes. Restoration of respiration. I love that. I'm going to preach that one day. Restoration of respiration. How you need your breath to come back into your body. Ooh I 
I can preach it now. Seven churches, seven eyes, seven spirits. Seven is the number of perfection. Why? Because it comprises of four and three. What's four and three? Four and three is four and three. That equals seven. What do these numbers mean? Three, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, ruler of heaven. But not only is he ruler of heaven, but he's ruler of four. What's that? North, south, east, west. And so he's ruler of heaven and earth. And you come up with seven. Perfect. And the prophet said, I'm coming back in seven days. Meaning what? My time will be perfect. Would you tell somebody that God's timing is perfect? You've got to understand that you're not here by coincidence. You're here in the timing of God. I, I preached last Sunday a message, another form of 917. And, 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 and uh, this young lady who had just visited us from a television station or somewhere, she, she, she came to me, well, no, Alana brought me to her and said, I cannot believe the message today because it was exact what I needed. She said, I'm having difficulty in my marriage and I got married on the numbers that you gave, 217. Noah and the ark. Noah went into the ark 217. Let's call it February 17th. And the ark rested on 717. She said, I got married on 217. And this is the anniversary of that marriage on 717. And she said, I don't understand why I'm having my difficulties, but these numbers mean something. I said, well, what it means is that between two and seven is five. I said, your marriage might be troubled, but remember that Jesus went to the ark, Noah entered the ark on 217, and he rested on 717. So what you need to do is rest because five grace is the bridge between your two and seven. And, and I began to minister to help her encourage her in a marriage just from numbers that were exactly applicable to her that God is an exact God is a God of details. That's why I don't buy in to prophets who call themselves prophets and prophetess and say, hey, the Lord's going to bless you. I'm already blessed. I don't need you to prophesy that I'm going to be blessed. Everybody who wants to be blessed, give $100. Well, if you got $100, you're already blessed. Don't try to manipulate. Now, sometimes God may move that way, but I'm saying, don't come to try to manipulate and use the name of God and use general stuff. God's going to bless you with a house. I got one, two, three, five. I got one, you see. I don't need that. But give me an exact word. Give me something that I don't have to doubt whether it's God or not. Give me something that I know nobody knows except. Because God is that kind of God that when he gives a word, he says, I'm coming in seven days. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to bless you. Saul, I'm going to come in seven days. And this is where we get our text. That while Saul was waiting, 
The Bible says, when the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. And Saul looked at his army and it was falling apart. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to talk to somebody. Somebody better listen. Because you're at a point in life that it looks like stuff is falling apart. It's coming unglued. You can't hold it together. You can't keep it together. And the circumstances seem to be stronger than you are. You're not hit you. You're not hearing me. Your situation seems to be more powerful than you are. And there are times that your situation and your circumstance seems, seems to be more powerful than God. Or at least he's working on somebody else's problem and he forgot me over here. Oh, Y'all yeah. don't hear me today? I'm talking to somebody. Are you hearing me? And sometimes when our circumstances become of such that they're out of our control, then we try to do things in our own power to bring it back together. Saul saw his army falling apart. He saw everybody leaving him. Some of you see stuff leaving you. People leaving you. Friends that you used to have leaving you. Folk that you used to rely on not there anymore, falling apart. And you, you, you and I try to, to do stuff to bring life back together, to glue our world back together. And Saul looked at things going awry in this seven day period. And, and, and he believed Samuel, Samuel said, I'm coming back in seven days to offer up a sacrifice. And it was necessary that Samuel offer the sacrifice because they were at war. They were in battle. And that sacrifice had to be made in order for the men and the nation to come together and believe that God was with them. And so six days had gone by. Six days and a half had gone by. Six days and 22 hours had gone by. Six days and 23 hours had gone by. Six days, 23 hours and 59 minutes had gone by. And Samuel still had not showed up. Oh, some of you right now feel that God is a no-show because I've been waiting on him. Just like he said, and he hasn't come through. <laughs> Woo! Oh my goodness, I don't have time to finish this. Y'all won't let me finish. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mm. But Habakkuk chapter 2, and verse 3, I want to give you this. This is at the very end, Angelita. It's very, because this is one of my favorite scriptures. When I start getting nervous <laughs> about what God said he's going to do, yeah. and he said it five months ago, Two years ago, yeah, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and, and he said it when I was young that I could have helped him to bring it to pass. And now he's waiting until I got a little older and my steps a little slower. I don't have the strength I used to have. 
And if he wants me to help him out, I can't do as much as I used to do. He should have come when I could have helped him out and made him look good. If I'm talking to you, just raise your hand and wave it. Praise. Just act like you're praising, you know. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Back at 2 and 3 of the Living Bible says, But these things I plan won't happen right away. You see, when God says something, it just may not happen right away. Because God is not always a right away God. Remember, he's also a God of long. He said, these things I plan won't happen right away. But they will happen, how? Slowly. Come on. Steadily. And surely. Three S's. They will happen how? Come on. Slowly. Steadily. Just because it's slow doesn't mean it's not sure. Just because God is slow doesn't mean he's not sure. He's not the one that's not sure. You are. All right. <laughs> oh, who am I preaching to beside me? Oh, okay. S slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches. Naomi, you could have called me on the telephone. I could have told you this. But, but, but the time approaches when the vision, come on, read it with me, will be what? When God says something, it's slow, it's steady. And it's sure. Here's the problem. It's in the invisible realm. And you don't see it coming at you. You call it delay. And God said, no, it's slow. It's steady. But it's Sure. If it seems slow, I don't even know why he wrote that. If it seems slow, yeah, it seems slow. What are you talking about? If. If it seems slow, do not despair. Mm. For these things will surely, come on, help me somebody. Y'all act like you can't see that far. Oh. They will surely Hallelujah. come to pass. Just be patient. Tell somebody next to you, settle down. Just be patient. Don't mind me. For they will not be overdue a single day. What God said he's going to do in your life. He's working on it right now. And the devil is throwing mud in your face, Mama Joyce. So you can't see the divine process. He's trying to make you feel. Mother D, that you miss God. You didn't miss God. How 
can you miss God and he's everywhere? How can you miss God and he's in heaven and he's earth? If I fly to the utmost parts of the earth, he's there. If I go to hell, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. How are you going to miss God? But they that wait, come on, help me, yeah. on the Lord yeah. shall renew yeah. their strength. Yeah. And the fact that you are still here and still kind of believing means you haven't missed God yet because you still got a little strength. You still got a hand raised. You still got praise in your mouth. You haven't missed him yet. I'm closing. And so Saul waited six days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. And so he stepped out of faith into sight. I love you, John. Because I, say, I see you doing stuff in faith. Man who couldn't walk. Now he's standing up while the word's being preached. Saul let time talk him out of faith. Because he was going by time. And he thought he had missed Samuel. And he thought Samuel lied to him. Stop accusing God in your mind because you would never say it. But some of you believe that God lied to you. That he didn't tell you the truth. But you need to know. That God is not a man. This is not your uncle we're dealing with. Happy birthday. We're not dealing with your nephew. We're not dealing with your cousin. We're not dealing with your son who told you he's going to stop by three days ago and you haven't seen him yet. We're not dealing with a man. God is not a man. Come on, help me. That he should lie. When he says I'm coming in seven days, he means I'm coming in seven days. Oh, put that scripture back up. I forgot something. I'm back up. Ah, I forgot something. I forgot something. No, that's not the one. That's okay. Let me see. Let me see what that scripture is. Oh, Lord Jesus. Y'all got time? Don't mind waiting. Jeremiah 29 11 again. Jeremiah 29 11. That, that says, For I know. See, our problem is we, we really don't think God knows. We think we know about we better than God knows about we. But God says, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. But the devil 
It's trying to make you believe that God has nothing for you. The devil wants you to think if you trust God with your life, you're going to be greatly disappointed. The devil wants you to think if you turn your life over to Jesus, you're going to be greatly disappointed. But God says, look, I got thoughts and plans for you that you don't know anything about. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you. If you would just simply trust me. Come on, just tell somebody, just trust God. You know, Pastor Cunningham, you know what about God? He, he's been doing this a long time. That, that's, that's revelation for somebody. Just tell somebody, God's been doing this a long time. Amen. I went to Philadelphia to preach years ago and they said Bishop Blackwell I wasn't a bishop then they said Apostle Blackwell is coming and they would always Philadelphia was a hot spot for me and when I get ready to go there God moved I moved in the gift so until they would sing a song you better watch out you better not cry you better not pout I'm telling you why Luther Blackwell's coming to town And so the conversation was on my way there that I was coming to town. And somebody asked the pastor, how long has Luther Blackwell been preaching? She said, I think he was preaching when God was a teenager. <laughs> it, it, it may seem... Elder Washington, that I've been around a long time. But let me tell you about God. For you who don't know, God's been around <laughs> for a long, 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 long time. He won't even tell his age. He's the God of eternity, and we're yes. trying to make him fit in time. Yes. We're trying to make him do stuff in our time. Yes. He said, just hang in there. I'll be there. Samuel said, Saul, I'll be there. But Saul could not wait because time had him fooled. Would you tell somebody, time will fool you. You will think it's time. I'll, I'll, I'll prove. I'll prove to you about time, something about time. I'll prove to you something about time. Y'all got these pretty bracelets and no watches. What time is it? What time is it? You got a watch? Watch. Watch. Don't give me no, don't give me the, the phone. The watch. What time's your watch say? What time's your? Oh, y'all got 12 20? It's right on the dot. That's not true. You need glasses. You got 12 22. What time you got? Is that digital? Huh? What time you got? Oh, 12.30. How many want to go by her watch? 12.30. Y'all get out of here sooner. Amen. My, my point is this, that we can't depend on time because all our times are... I can't rely on what you say it's time for. Because your time may be different than my time and her time and his time. So the only man who really knows what time it is. Lord Jesus. Lord God Almighty. 
is God. He has it pinpointed down to a minuscule, a micrometer. Saul said, I can't wait. I'm going to step over into another lane and offer up a sacrifice. And by the time he was offering up the sacrifice, Samuel walked in. (laughs) By the time you start carrying out your plans, God will walk in. And, And say, well, you're just going with your plan. You have just forfeited eternity. You forfeited eternity because you tried to fit eternity into your time frame. And as a result of that, your kingdom is not going to be secure. The enemy is going to ravage you because you didn't Wait on me and obey my time. What I am saying to you, that you and I are challenged to survive the weight of time. Because time will keep pressing you. Time will tell you, it's time for you to, you need to be better than this. You need to do something. You need to get up out of St. Louis. It's time for you to get out. Don't you see nothing is happening here? And as soon as you get your little 18-wheeler truck packed, God steps in and said, I had something for you, but you left before it was. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lazarus is thinking, Jesus, you're four days late. The modern Jesus said, are you a fool? Jesus says, I don't even know how to be late. (laughs) He says, dig this. If I leave late, when I get there, I'm still on time. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. You and I will always feel pressure to act because of time. But faith keeps time under subjection. (laughs) Faith keeps time under subjection. When your mind and other folk are saying it's time, your faith said, but God said. Oh, yes. never be late I can never work in your life late I can never bring about solutions in your life late I don't care if he is dead I don't care if he is thinking everything that was dead about Lazarus have you thought of this everything that was dead everything that had gone awry in Lazarus body Jesus gathered all of that and put it back together. Because Jesus knew where the healthy skin went. (laughs) Oh, now, my head is thinking, now my imagination is going, El Dive. Jesus knew where all the health went. 
and all he needed to do was, was speak and health came back skin came back breath came back life came back everything came back and when Lazarus came from the dead elder leaf nobody said oh you sure look bad because when God does it he looks back on what he has done and says it's good come on that's very good stand up and give the Lord a praise